Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another video from our channel, Scientology Peeling the Onion. My name is Mark Fisher, and I'm here with my co-host, Janice Gillum Grady. How's it going, Janice? Good, Mark. Good day, everybody, and thank you for watching. Uh, we've been doing some real good uh, interviews lately, and yeah. we're having a lot of fun doing it. And I hope you are keeping up with us because you don't want to miss, miss the people we've been talking with. That's exactly right. Yeah, we've been pumping them out at least a couple of weeks. And so, you know, yeah. it's a lot to watch and we understand that. But uh, you can always watch them anytime. So, uh, but we appreciate all the people who watch and your support. Uh, if you would, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel and hit that like button. And uh, we've got uh, return guests. Isn't that right, Janice? Yeah, we have Dan Locke back with us. What is it, Dial Wide FN Dan or? No, Dial Wide Dan. <laughs> Dial Wide Dan, that's right. Yeah, he's back with us and, and he's got some hell of some good stories. That's right. He's got some stories. Uh, uh, we're going to pick up kind of where we left off, but he's got some stories about different things that happened to him in the C organization. And all. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's welcome back Dan Locke. Hi, Dan. How you doing? Oh, good. Thank you very much. How, I already asked how you guys are doing, but to let everybody else yeah. in on this, they're doing okay. 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 Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. And your sound, your sound is in sync, so everything's good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I have one so present time off. problem. Oh, what's that? I don't have any water and I'm thirsty. So I'm going to keep oh, okay. if you see my attention yeah. looking a little bit. It's when I hear my wife going in the kitchen. I'm going to shout out to her. I'll mute the microphone for a little bit. Okay, no I'd, I'd offer you mine. I got lemon juice here, but okay, sorry. Okay, distance, yeah. Okay, so welcome to the third of a projected 37 episodes featuring Dan Locke's story <laughs> and the Sea Organization <laughs> to take place over the next four years. Yeah, yeah you know, exactly. We left off last time, uh, you know, we talked about your time at ASHO, uh, American St. Hill Organization as a registrar and the change when Dianetic Clear came out and power processing went away and how you, you know, the buy now was going on with the price increases and all that jazz. Uh, and then uh, we were going to pick up, uh, you've got a story that you want to start off with uh, regarding, you know, Scientology and the Sea Organization. When was it, Janice? In the late 1980s? Is that when it was? No, the, early. The, the, early the, child, the kid band? Mid. Mid. I think it was mid 80s was when... Uh, yeah, what, Miscavige ordered Guillaume to put out a flag order saying no more kids. That's right. We're talking about no more kids. It was uh, in the sea organization, meaning you couldn't have babies. And if you and if you did, uh, you'd be shipped out to an outer outer organization, uh, an outer class four organization. So um, anyway, so Dan had a story regarding that, right, Dan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I star in it I, or I have a minor supporting role, at least. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, anyway, so um, adventures in the sea organization, they can run the gamut from, uh, you know, exciting archaeological digs in the Mediterranean with Janice and the gang to, you know, all those different remarkable stories. I've been so blessed to hear from you guys and your guests that the old flag flag things to. Uh, I don't know how you group these service Scientology service org stories in, but uh, anyway, there's all, all these stories feature very, very good people trying the best to make things go right under oftentimes some pretty ridiculous circumstances. Right. And, you know, amongst the, I know there's a, a mixed uh, bag of uh, old time Scientologists that come here and people that are just interested in the subject. Um, and, Anybody who's listened to this for very long has heard uh, guests talk about confessionals where where Scientologists will talk about uh, things that they've done that the church considers errant or misbehaved or whatever. And in Scientology, we call those actions overt acts. And they're basically things that uh, are done 
uh, ideally that just aren't the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics, but are sometimes just things that the church doesn't want you to do that aren't necessarily conscious survival at all, but the church doesn't, just don't want you to do it, do it or think it or what have you. Anyway, an, one of the definitions of an overt act is a solution someone, something someone does in an effort to solve a problem. If you take a look at any criminal action and you interview the criminal involved, you'll find some sense in it. He's doing it to solve a problem. He doesn't think he has enough money or, you know, enough PlayStations or, you know, whatever the problem is that person might be trying to solve. Or he just needs one more car, <laughs> one more stolen car, you know. And classically, you know, like, you know, people talk about Australia. So many of the crimes that got people to go to Australia were just economic crimes because England was in such a bad shape. A lot of people had no other thing to do to resort to uh, and a little bit of criminality, like stealing a loaf of bread might just get you a one-way ticket to Australia, from the stories I've heard. Right. So in, even in psychology, I kind of give basically – anybody who's committed an overt act on me, a bit of a break, because they were all solving, attempting to solve problems. And one of the problems that Scientology Sea Org members had, or Scientologists had, was the phenomenon of, of, uh, of uh, children. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, at one time, uh, uh, oh, a Scientologist pre the the child roles, it was announced that uh, uh, he and his wife were going to have a child. And people clapped and applauded. And he says, yeah, turns out that reproduction is the basis of morale. You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and only Mark's laughing and Janice is giving a little bit of grim because that's something that I guess in most orgs you would Chinese school throughout your life in front of an org board. You'd yell out, a Ron Hubbard datum that production is the basis of morale. Right. That's right. So when this this friend of mine said, "Well, reproduction is the basis of morale," <laughs> he got a stern look from a bunch of messengers that were, I'm, I could read their minds. They were thinking, "That's J and D, you know, joking and deraging, degrading." Right. An unwritten rule is, "Thou shalt not make any jokes, even if they're pretty funny right. and harmless, about anything Scientology related." Right. You know. Anyway, so so one of the solutions, child care in Scientology organizations that I'm aware of, maybe not in a more ideal scene such as St. Hill where you got to have something to do with the Hubbard kids, but in every Sea Org installation I've been involved with, children are generally neglected. Right. And even at St. Hill, there was no supervision. Even when we played with the Hubbard kids, there was no supervision. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, I, di I didn't know that, but I'm sure they were treated at least better than most in that the Ron's kids. Yeah. They did have an, they did have a nanny who, you know, cleaned their rooms, washed their clothes, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. So it's a problem, but people kind of minimize the problem. It was just, it's just this hope that things are going to turn out okay. And I, I didn't have a child there in the worst of, of times. Uh, Patty Lamar will probably be able to tell you about that. Or Patty Gallo. I forget, I forget their last name now or then. Yeah. At any rate, so without getting into all that kind of stuff, because there's definitely people that know more about it, eventually there came down a solution, which was, I got it. Let's just stop having children in the sea organization. And overnight, without any warning, it just came out that, you guys can't have kids anymore. Stop even thinking about it. Right. Because now I'm getting, uh, I'm gonna, I should have shut down the phone. Give me just a moment here. Do you hear it on your end too? No. No. No, I do. Yeah. Okay. Just turned it off. At any rate, so, it, it, and people beforehand, you know, oftentimes a, a recruiter could get their stats up because he purposely go out and recruit a family and a mother and father might come in and with three or four children. It was like, you got right. six people in the Sea Org that day. Hurrah. And nobody even looked at the fact that uh, three or four of them would be non-productive other for anything else other than, you know, 
mischievous, mis mischief and dirty diapers and stuff for some number of time, they still counted as kind of like recruits. Right. And, and I knew kids that I knew families at pack, pack that had five or six different kids. It was just like every year there'd be a new kid. And yeah. Ivan for, Oblinsky. He had five yeah, kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, there's another that has six or seven and, and beautiful, wonderful family, great kids. And uh, we just looked at it, I guess, as a little, you know, future personnel resource, as it is, as it has turned out to be, because I think most of the Sea Org members now are either the children of old Sea Org members or the children of, or, of public people. Yeah, I agree. But, and, and, you know, all that we got, it didn't really take us off post very much, because even in the best of circumstances, you were only allowed an hour a day to spend with your child. Uh, during production time it was called family time and and then there might be if you're very lucky on your day off if you had one or during your your cleaning uh time but nevertheless somebody uh, decided i guess you're telling me it was david miscavige and and guillaume yes let's yes. put in this policy that says no more kids right, right. i was there when dm told guillaume to write it and uh, i was I was on mission, I believe at that time when Guillaume had to write it, I was working with him. And I remember myself thinking, that's not what I agreed to. And, you know, I grew up in the Sea Org and Hubbard had even talked about allowing parents who had kids to come up to the gold base, you yeah. know, before he had to take off into hiding. But my whole thing was, wait a minute, who's deciding that for me? That's not my choice. Yeah. Yeah, and it's such an unnatural thing to be a person and and not have a you know a desire for uh, you know for a family. It's part of the second dynamic, the right, you know, right. family. Yeah. And uh, at any rate, so at that time, I'd already been married, and and uh, I don't know if everybody's talked about getting married in this organization, but uh, typically, I think my uh, marriage was somewhat like most others, at least in the pack area, uh, there were rules against, um, uh, oh, rom you know, being romantic. They called it heavy petting. If you, you could date a girl or go out to a movie with a girl, if you could some, find some free time, but, you know, you couldn't do what kids like to do. Yeah. Or make yeah, out. No, we, yeah, we've talked about this. Been in that? Okay, yeah. so we'll go into all that kind of stuff. So I hardly knew the woman I married just because you can only get to know people. It's hard to get to know people um, just because of the rush of, of, of uh, production. But I managed to find a girl to say, yeah, let's, okay, let's go for it. You know, and it was almost like a, I always looked at it as almost like a personnel problem because, you know, because <laughs> I knew I could, Scientologists could make anything go right. So you weren't looking for a soulmate. You were just looking somebody could tolerate you in a way, you know, because <laughs> otherwise, well, what are you doing thinking about being off host? So I, I found a very attractive woman. Okay. And, uh, and she was a messenger in East U.S. Her name had been Teresa Pelton. I'm sure she wouldn't be against me talking about it. And she had only been in Scientology for, I think, a year or two. By that time, I had been involved for Oh, 15, 16, 17 years and on staff for that long. It was 1987, by the way, when that came out. Okay. Anyway, and, you know, very shortly after uh, getting married, we found out she was pregnant. And, it, you know, I was just elated, you know, and she was too, just excited. And I don't know when it was after that, a month or two later it came down. Oh, uh, you're not allowed to have children and be in the C organization anymore. And, the and she was, was already pregnant. She, she was, was already, already pregnant. pregnant. Right. And abortion at that time would have been the last thing on, on my mind. And nobody talked about it in the Sea Org at that time. That was that was never an option prior to that rule coming out. It, it, it was just you had your kid, you know, it went to the child care org, and you got back on post. <laughs> right. So this rule said basically that if you're if you have a child in the Sea Org now, well, you can, if you're already in the Sea Organization, you'll have to go to a class four org, generally one that's not doing well, is economically not strong. And you in your Sea Org status are going to bolster that org up 
and ideally you're going to make it a nice big happy place you know full of upstats and productivity and uh so what happened was uh the baby was born and then it came surprisingly to us uh, because it's a little bit ambiguous it what it didn't say what what about if you're already pregnant right so uh, my yeah now was she in east u.s at the time yeah, or had she, was, she transferred she, to los angeles no she was cmo east u.s and i was posted in new york as an asho ao oh, representative okay okay See, the, the name of the game back then was if you wanted to sell asho services in the field you sold ao services and then you sold the ot preps you you sold the i'll change the nomenclature mark yeah there, there's various services between all the different services in in a central org or a, an introductory org or what they called a class four or class five org and the advanced organization where the ot levels were delivered in flag and those few services were delivered at asho they were called ot preparations in solo course part two just an auditing action in a course to learn how to solo audit so i would i was based in new york and i traveled to philadelphia boston tampa uh you know all the different east u.s orgs detroit cincinnati on and on and on to reg people to sell them their ot levels and their ot preps and their solo course understand yeah carry on but, with the yeah pregnancy. so anybody anybody who does that kind of stuff that makes money for the church if they can keep doing it uh they're kind of favored and they like to keep people that win at that on that job right, right. okay and where my wife was kind of an administrator and i I don't know for whatever reason i wasn't part of the decision making they they told my wife you have to go to a class five org and they told me that i have to stay i need to stay as an asho representative in the east us so uh which meant we had to leave our c organization birthing uh our paid for birthing and where was she going where, where was she she going? was at C celebrity center in new york so, but she, so you guys were still going to be based in New York, but she was going to be in a different organization. Yeah. And we couldn't, we couldn't have Sea Org birthing and Sea Org benefits because. Why? That doesn't make She wasn't any allowed sense. to be on Sea Org birthing because she was a class four <laughs> staff member. It's stupid. Yeah. And, and then when the child was born, was it put in Sea Org childcare or how, did you have no, to hire no. a nanny? No. What we did, we, we moved to class four org birthing. There was a, somebody there like a lot of like cc new york was a pretty pretty good org it was pretty it made money it delivered services yeah so there was about a dozen staff members uh living in a in a uh, apartment building in manhattan um so and, talk about a solution that then became a problem it created yeah, yeah, other yeah. problems yeah 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 <laughs> it was weird so and i and, and i couldn't i couldn't go to you know, typically what class four staff members do, even CR members based in class four orgs, they'll work a non-Scientology job, you know, in a restaurant or for another yeah. Scientologist and they'll come in evening and weekend hours and work at the org. But I wasn't allowed to do that because I was still a Sea Org member. And she didn't want to do it because she had spent a few years as a messenger being, I'm a messenger, I'm like the cat's pajamas. I'm right on Ron's team. There's nobody, you know. So she was she not considered a Sea Org member anymore? Or was she a Sea no, Org member but, but had to be working? In those circumstances, you're still considered a Sea Org member, but you're posted in a class four org. It was so you're rules. treated was, like a class four org. In a way, but I imagine you, there's some higher measure of respect by virtue of your SO status. But it's so stupid because it didn't matter because she's still a C, if she was still a Sea Org member, they still should have been paying for her support. Well, Cause that was the deal that you that you signed up for when you became a Sea Org member. <laughs> well, you see, perhaps that makes sense, but sometimes that's a little too close in the rear view mirror. We I understand. Kind of, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying how ridiculous this whole solution was that Miscavige yeah. had. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So what did you guys end up doing? Well, so uh, we worked there, but, you know, once again, true to my form of ever figuring out the most <laughs> in terms of like following orders. Yes, sir. <laughs> I did what I was told, you know. Yeah. Oh man. 
so it uh, had me oftentimes traveling around the United States with an infant baby and going to, if I knew that the org, sometimes these orgs had nurseries for the women working in them, you know, and if I called up and found it, they had a nursery, I'd say, hey, do you mind if I bring my kid along? And <laughs> they would say, okay. And in different circumstances, I remember going to people's homes. And, you know, this is all stuff. I talk daily with my people in charge at, at ASHO. You know, how do we figure this out? And it wasn't just my dumb ideas, me being dumb. It was like, well, you could do this. So I would bring an infant child with me when I go out to Boston or whatever and I go knock on somebody's door and I'd be there with a baby. I guess it kind of worked out in a way. Well, I, I just let me for our viewers sake, just so people remember the American St. Hill organization is in Los Angeles, California. And yeah. Dan is working for them in New York, in New yeah. York and, yeah. and no longer being covered by the Sea Org and having to take care of his own baby because his wife is working at Celebrity Center in New York. So therefore she cannot take advantage of what little child care there was for yeah. Sea Org members' kids. So, yeah, yeah. This is how ridiculous this is. And yeah. it is a form of abuse. You know what I mean? I mean, at least at least you had to have your kid, at least you could have your, your child with you. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Now, in wait a way a it was pretty go ahead. Wasn't there a child care facility for the Sea Org members in New York? Yeah, but we couldn't take we couldn't take advantage of it. So you had to take the child. Oh my God! <laughs> well, but, at least you, know, you got to was, bond with your. Kind of a, at least you got to bond a, with your son. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That was a, <laughs> like I say, in a way, it was a benefit in that their their C or treatment of kids probably well, I never experienced it, but it was, but it was likely horrendous. the typical yeah. situation: an untrained personnel, undermanned. Yeah. You know. Uh, let's see. Uh, so at any rate, um, so we have the child, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And then while we're there, Karen Schles, who's now Karen Presley. Is Presley, that right? yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. She was something to do with central marketing, uh, you know, international management marketing. Right. And she came to New York on a, uh, on a recruitment tour. And she saw my wife there at the Celebrity Center. Like I say, attractive, smart, everything plus pointy about her. And said, I guess she thought to herself, all I have to do is interpret this flag order about children in the Sea Org a little bit differently than her seniors did, than my wife's seniors did. And I've got a new marketing person for central marketing. And so that's what she did. She approached my wife and said, you belong at Central Marketing. This is ridiculous what's going on for you here. You should be uplines at Central Marketing. At, at that point, Central Marketing was based in PAC, but they knew ultimately okay. it would be at, at, at the Golden Era Studios. At the Gold Base, yeah. At the Gold mm -hmm. Base. But at that time, all these guys, uh, Peter Cook and uh, Charles Wildbank and yeah. all these neat people were there at, at, at PAC. Yeah. Anyway, so they came and got her. And this is the kids like six or eight months old at that time. And uh, uh, they recruited her to be in central marketing. They just said, all this stuff you just went through is arbitrary. Uh, you're going to central marketing. And I said, well, hold on a second. Um, my name is Dan. I'm me? over here. You haven't what been about talking me? to me very much. <laughs> but here I am. And I'm this gal's husband. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. What, what, what's your scene here? <laughs> I go, well, I'm an Asho Reg, you know, touring around out here. And I'm still on post as an Asho Reg. And he says, oh, okay. Well, we're going to take you too. You're going to be central marketing staff. And I go, well, you know, I, I, I like you guys. I don't, don't want to be a downer, but I got this history of LSD. And I wanted to go in the Sea Org. I've made it. I've wanted to go in the Sea Org. I'm not a Sea Org, but. Upline so much. I don't know how many times. You were times in the Sea Org already, right? Yeah. You were in the I mean, yeah. I could go up lines. I wanted to go up lines. Oh, okay. I said. Yeah. I want to go. I want to be as close to Ron as I can possibly get. Right. Give me the highest responsibility thing you can get, please. But all that stuff would always get turned down. But uh, Ron was dead by this time. 
That's right. He was. No. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 he died in '86. Yeah. Yeah, and this was '87. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they. So Karen says, "Oh, no problem. We've done it before. We can get you." Even in spite of your, I think it was even her, her husband, Peter. I think he had some LSD history. That's right. And uh, but they they somehow there's been a f couple two or three circumstances or some small number of circumstances where they were able to push that aside. And she said, "I could be the next one." I said, "You know, somehow, man, okay, you know." But I, I didn't I, I didn't think it would work out, and it didn't. And I don't think it's it was not because. You know, I don't think my postulates are so good that it pervaded and counteracted Karen's postulates and made it not happen. It's just that I tried so many times and been disapproved. Anyway, so what that resulted in was uh, my wife going up lines and leaving the child behind uh, and me moving, hold, being brought on, back to Asho. Hold on. When you okay. say going up lines, so she, did, you said central marketing was in L.A. So did yeah. she go well, to L.A.? Initially, he was brought to Central Marketing in Los Angeles, yeah, right. and uh, uh, I had the child with me part of the time, and my my mother lived in Los Angeles at the time, and for a little while, my mother was taking care of our child. Okay, but so hold he on didn't a second. Go into you guys the were care. both back into the Sea Org, oh, so yeah. so so he well, my wasn't wife went, went to of... went to uh, my wife went to Los Angeles with my daughter of uh, my son rather. And uh, and my son was being taken care of by my mother, at least for some time. But, but why wasn't he brought back into science in the Sea Organization for their nursery care? Well, this we're far far along, pretty far along the lines there. And by this time, for some months now, they've been not recruiting any children, so there was nobody to take care of infants. Oh. My child was still an infant. I see. You know, uh, you know, all those times I I was bringing him around. I had him one in one of those uh, front-facing papoose things. I was just looking at my son like this. He, he didn't <laughs> walk. You know. I've done hundreds of hours of TR0 on an infant. <laughs> anyway, as a matter of fact, first time I saw him walk was when I came to L.A. after some months of him being there, you know, with my wife and Pac, and, you know, and they brought my son out, and he ran to me, and, you know, into my, my arms, you know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway, so uh, that started. So, and then what happened was for six or seven months, my they had to they put her through a little kind of apprenticeship and marketing at Celebrity Center, Int, CCLA, CCN, and then they uh, while uh, the marketing guys were in that horseshoe area, the area around the back of the complex, she worked there, and Off I would Catalina. go over there. Uh, pardon me. Off Catalina. Yeah, yeah. And I go out there and that's where I got to know Peter Cook pretty well because they were all very nice to me because, you know, I was a husband of one of their own. I got to know Charles Wildbank. Did you guys yeah. know Charles Wildbank very well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What a great guy. You know, he's deaf, but I went to a uh, opera concert with him. Because he we, knew we've, we've seen him recently um, when we were in Florida on a cruise a few years ago. Yeah, yeah great, great guy. guy. Yeah. When we got back from the cruise, he came and joined a bunch of us at yeah. the Airbnb. Well, what we all where had. were you doing? Were you were you just transferred back out to Asho? I was transferred in, back to Asho California? because that, they said, "Okay, she's in this SO now. You should be, but with your kid, come on back to Asho." And I was regging inside the org. Right, because you were a money maker. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, and then shortly after that, that's when my wife. Uh, I, I think it was maybe six or eight months, something like that. Then she got transferred up to gold without Because my they son. moved all of central marketing up there to, yeah. to gold. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To the hidden base at Kilman Hot Springs. Yeah. yeah, I didn't know. I kept my P's and Q's, I guess, with a little bit of prying around. I could have figured out where that was, but I minded my own business and she was in this place, you know. And, and then the assurance was, well, we're going to get you up here and she's been going to be able to come down here often. Hey, well, I have a question for you. I have a question, just just an interjection. As a staff member in Los Angeles, you didn't know where the no, international no. base was, uh, right? Where did you think it was? <laughs> no, I just knew it couldn't be too awfully far, 
right. because I knew it took three or four hours to get here, something yeah. like that. <laughs> you know, and your your, yeah. your wife could come down and visit, so it couldn't have been like you know halfway across the country or something like that. I yeah, guess. yeah. Anyway, but the, the thing on it was, you know, they kept her busy. It was just like you know anywhere else; they keep people busy. So she yeah. she didn't come down. You know, she came down about truthfully, no exaggeration once maybe twice a year and it would well you're raising the kid in los angeles well to the extent that one does raise a kid as a uc or member right yeah los they get angeles. neglected you know they don't get the same care that normally kids would i spent that hour family time with them and i i picked them up from the from the organization where they were their playground was and stuff and brought them home and then woke up early to bring them to the you know, and, the and State you basically raised him then, right? In other words, like he he stayed with you at night, and yeah. uh, you you basically raised him. You know, well, like I say, you know, it's not really that much a, a walk to the local McDonald's to play with those in those indoor swing things yeah. with all the little rubber yeah. balls and stuff like that, and then a walk back home. You know, a hurried walk back home because you only got an hour and half an hour of it's traveling walking someplace. Yeah. Now, did your wife as a mother have an issue with having to go up to Int and be away from you and the child? Well, well she was maybe totally she did, fine but you it. know, it's no case on post, no complaining. You just didn't do that. Right. Right. And, and uh, I expect she did, uh, but, you know, we didn't talk about it. Okay. I, you know, there was so many times where she'd say she'd come during the following weekend, and she but she do. didn't show up. And there's this be this anticipation for hours that she might be here any minute she'd never show mm -hmm. up okay. yeah and it's not necessarily her fault to be a yeah oh yeah was out there because yeah. you you had to get permission yeah and if there was working on something that had to be done tomorrow there was no permissions given you know yeah. so you know parents parents always were made to choose their work and their position over their family and their kids yeah. always 100 yeah. percent of the time that's how it was. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so it was, uh, so that was. Didn't eventually, uh, though, uh, shortly thereafter, Janice, didn't they start working on moving, um, you know, the ranch or like out uh, Happy Valley and bringing the kids for the staff members that were up there? How long after yeah, 87 or 88 was, was that? Well, that was uh, the end of 89, 90. I got involved with it in uh, the middle of 1990. I worked with it just a couple of months before I blew. Right. So, Dan, how did that work out for you? What did they eventually then bring your son up to the gold base, or did they keep him down in LA, or what happened? Yeah, I kept him down in LA. And, yeah, because uh, Dan couldn't go to the base. Yeah. Oh, and you guess, got turned down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And th and what happened then is that when the there was some riots in LA after Rodney King, uh, was Rodney right. King was this black fellow Murder. that, yeah. I yeah, guess it's kind of famous yeah. thing. Yeah. Anyway, and there was riots, you know, in South Central LA, which was just a couple, three miles away, maybe four or five miles, not very far from the base. And there was a concern that this was no longer a safe place for children to be. Right. I don't know if they'd owned that ranch property, uh, or they bought it especially for this or whatever, but oh, uh, the, all these children the were one, bought up here. The one in LA, the one in Pac. In, no, the uh, one in LA, which was out by Magic Mountain, right? Yeah, uh, no further north yeah. than that. Yeah, that was when I was thinking of leaving. I had actually gone down and inspected that because a mission had fired to find something for the Pack kids, and I'd gone down and looked at it. And my question was, how are the parents going to get out here to see their see their kids if you put them yeah, out here? They have no cars. Drive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And then I was, I was gone before it was approved to uh, purchase. Yeah, well, what they did is uh, during uh, during the org cleaning program time when you had that little few hours on Saturday morning right. to right. work on your own personal cleaning hygiene and stuff they would take the parents that had uh, children and they would go up there and that they spend that time up there. So like you say, it was a, in a bus, it's even slower than a car. So right. you had to wake up pretty early and you had to leave early to get any time up there at all. 
right. to get back on both. Right. And the other part of that is when that happened, I was transferred to Asho Foundation <laughs> and I wasn't allowed to go up during that time. Because foundation oh. hours were evenings and weekends. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you couldn't go. And the cleaning program, it, it was Sunday mornings. Yeah. But ah. I figured out. I just didn't go off, up as often as other kids did. So my yeah. son, pretty much for years and years, I didn't go up often enough. Not as often as if I had been on, on some other schedule. And I rationalized it away as, you know, duty to the organization is more important, blah, blah, blah. Right. But that's how it went, you know, all the way through his entire life. You know. So the nannies, the nannies basically raised him. Yeah. To whatever, the other kids raised him because there's, as I understand, typically there's 250 kids there and maybe seven or eight adults. Right. And the kids well, took at, looked after each other. Yeah. And I don't know whether I'll get into it. Uh, maybe we'll see what sense this direction goes. But uh, later on in my life, when uh, years, years later, 15 years later, or, or when my son was 15 years old, uh, I ended up uh, taking care of lots of Sea Org members, children. Yeah, and you should get into that. That's a good story. Yeah, and it was interesting well, because I saw these kids. They didn't know how to hold a knife and fork. They would eat with their hands, you know, rice and casseroles off the plate. They just had none of these stuff that you generally learn, not by teaching, but by mimicry. Right. So not having adults at the table with them. They still ate like they were three years old. Right. That, how about uh, how about education for your son? Obviously, I mean, eventually at some point, did they have some schooling or something they did? Well, first of all, before I get into all that, all these some of these circumstances might seem tragic or, or really crummy. Uh, and there's was some stormy weather throughout a lot of this. Uh, he's doing well as a person. And he graduated. Uh, he, well, so now, now you, there is a happy ending. Let's just say that. Okay. But on the way there, uh, when we were eventually routed out of the Sea Org when he was 15 years old, uh, I was still a good Scientologist. I wanted to do the best I could for him. We took him to uh, the, the Delphian Foundation was considered the premier school for Scientologists in L.A. They had a, an outlet or a chapter or a branch there. But we took him there and they said, uh, we're not going to take him. He's he's 15 years old, but he's got the education. They tested him. They said he got the education of a nine-year-old, you know. Wow. And that was well, true with all these kids. They didn't know how to read or write. Yeah, I'd heard that Bruce Hines' son could not read or write when, when, uh, when he was 16 or 18 years old. Mm -hmm. He had to learn it in wow. order to get a job out of the Sea Org. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. He had some. He could read something, but not well. Like I said, they they test him fourth grade education. Right. But you know, right. when we got out, he didn't know. You know, the typical dumb things that maybe aren't important, but they kind of establish a, a commonality between kids. Didn't know what a state was. Didn't know what a mile was. Right. Didn't know what a capital city was. All these kind of boring, dumb things that you, they drill into you for one reason or another. I don't know why when you're a kid. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and I'd even heard there was one kid who always thought food just came from the kitchen. They had no idea that it came from a farm or from a slaughterhouse or a ranch or, you know, none of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my son, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, uh, you've had uh, uh, Javier, uh, you've had different people, different people. Jorge Avila. Jorge, yeah. Jorge, Jorge, yeah, excuse me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he'll want to. You want to whatever. I don't know if he already had enough. Any, at any rate, he used to look at it despairingly. But you know what? Can you do with these kind of things? Um, he was telling. We were talking about it just a few days ago. He says, "I also knew about chickens. I knew about this. I knew about camping out. I knew how to start a fire. I knew how to do various things. A lot of children going to conventional school didn't know how to do too." Right. Right. And I guess the camarade. And I tell you. When we left the sea organization, he was tighter, tight, tight, tight with some of the other kids that were routed out about the same time because they were all the, they, they clung to each other like kids that had been rescued from a shipwreck, you know, like. Yeah, it was their family. Yeah. Yeah. Clinging to so, each other. So your yeah. son, okay, we were at, you know, 
whatever you were taking care of him and eventually he ended up at the whatever the ranch property was out by magic mountain what about your wife was she did she stay up at the end base at the, uh, that whole time or did she, was she eventually sent down to la or what what happened there was one period of, i think about eight eight months or so where for some reason or another she and i think a couple other cmu staff were uh, brought over the hgb to more closely modern the hubbard guarantee building the mid-level um uh, or actually management. senior level uh, branch of management uh, maybe a mile or two away from the complex yeah, anyway she worked over there for work. yeah she worked over there for i think seven or eight months and there we had you know a more typical sea org uh, family situation but then that was just for a few months and then she went back up lines again uh for years and, until oh about a year uh before we were routed out of the C organization, she, I was I was sent to the RPF in 1998. I was there for some years, and we can whatever whenever you want to get into that, we'll get into that. And my wife also got sent to the RPF uh, about 2003 or so, 2002, 2003, when a yeah, whole RPF lot of people rehab got, rehabilitation project force, yeah, uh -huh. basically the Scientology prison, yeah. Uh -huh prison camp or rehabilitation rehabilitation camp, it that way yeah it's got some things that are prison like but other things yeah. aren't but anyway so yeah a majority almost all of her life all of her motherly life to that point she had been separated from us and and i was to a large degree separated from my son as well uh through too much of that all and right. uh which is kind of uh it's, it's not a good thing. It's, it's not the best the way things would best be. It's would best be. So, so when you left, you when you were routed out of the Sea Organization, um, when your son was fifteen years old. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Had he had he been working at a Scientology organization, or was he just being a kid that whole time, or what? No, he. Um, uh, I guess it was in two thousand three or sometime. Um, I, I imagine. You've ta talked about birthday games and St. Hill size. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was Asho's turn to be validated as a Sea Org size, St. Hill size uh, organization. And briefly. Just, which is actually kind of funny because it is a St. Hill organization. Yeah. And, yeah. But it wasn't the size of old St. Hill. The yeah. meaning it was it was small and failing. It, you know the way it they used it, it used to be the size of old St. Hill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that the, the St. Hill size thing, one of the things that they had different requirements or statistic levels that needed to be met for a variety of things, and one of them was number of personnel. Now I forgot what the number was, but recruitment into the Sea Organization was typically difficult regardless of campaigns, etc., a great week in the Sea Org might be four or five people recruited for all the different organizations in that area. And it wasn't uncommon to have zero. So to all of a sudden have a requirement to, let's say, let's say actually have maybe 60 or 70 staff members, mm -hmm. typically. And then all of a sudden you're supposed to have, I think if I recall correctly, 200 staff members. Well, <laughs> unless you're, uh, you know, Tom Cruise joins the Sea Organization and becomes a CO pack or something like that and organizes dance routines on L. Ron Hubbard Boulevard. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. So I guess somebody looked at the various resources around and it goes, huh, wow, what do you know? There's 250 kids up at the uh, ranch, let's go get a bunch of them. Plus, let's also, get... also, let me ask you this. Your son was like one of the last babies born yeah. right after the ban. So he, yeah. so the, the other kids must have been his age or older, right? Older, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, he was the youngest guy. Um, yeah. So, and, so, so and the, kids had, the kids had been used on projects, hadn't they, to like update the central files and yeah, different some, things like that? Because Jorge talked about that in the interview we did with him. Yeah, always very minor administrative stuff. Right. Very minor because they right. couldn't read. 
right. Uh, right. basically. And they, and they didn't have any experience other than ranch type experiences. And, uh, and I think they were used to giving a lot of shit and a lot of backflash to the backflash of the Scientology it means talking back, being antagonistic. Right. The adults that were there had to suffer through a lot of like, oh yeah, you want me to do that? Do it yourself. It was a lot of, it wasn't like sweet and orderly, you know. Right, right. Uh, at anyway, so uh, so they got somebody went up there and just got a whole bunch of kids, and brought them down and put them on all these minor administrative posts at Asho. And uh, the story I've heard, I don't remember if I heard this from my son or somebody else, but apparently, with all that rush of personnel, untrained personnel. The stats didn't go up. They stayed level or maybe even went down. So David Miscavige, in all his wisdom, thought, I'll go down and check it out to find out what's really going on down there, you know. And he gets in the elevator, maybe probably with an entourage. I doubt if he went anywhere in pack without without an entourage. Right. But a kid or two got on the line on, on in the elevator with him and didn't salute him smartly or looked at him like he's just a regular guy or. Yeah didn't bow down or maybe said something smart ass. I don't know what happened. Uh, no, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. So I, I can go right to the end of my CEO career. If you ever want to, we can go. Yeah, back yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, I, no, I, I'm interested. In what well, I'm interested. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened is, uh, I got to back up a little bit because, um, or, or let's just be, we'll be real simple about it. I didn't want to leave the C organization. I, I didn't route out because I wanted to. I mean, I didn't like the C organization very much, <laughs> but I felt duty bound to grin and bear it. Okay. Know? And I think that's a, a lot of people just hanging on, hanging on, hanging on. Yeah. Going to bed every night thinking, can this please, can we make this a little bit better? Can tomorrow right. be a bit better scene? <laughs> There's always yeah. that hope that it'll get better. Yeah. And this yeah. is, we're talking 2003, 2004? 2004 is when I left, but I went to the RPF in 1998. No, but I'm just saying, though, you said you were like, when they were, you didn't leave, they they made you. Yeah, that, what, right? what happened was my son had been brought to this Asher to be a St. Hill size org. And instead of cooperating and being, yes, sir, no, sir, whatever you like, sir, he was like giving him shit. And, you know, apparently he let off some firecracker or something in a conference room or something like that causes, you know, when you look at it in any other world than the C organization world, you go, oh, typical kid. Right. But in the Scientology world, it was like, this is outrageous. He's got to leave, you know. And it turns out he was kind of conspiring to leave a little bit, but didn't think he'd have to drag us out, his mom and his dad out with him. Uh, and uh, he had been visiting uh, uh, his mother's uh, brother who lived in the area on his day off and finding out about surfing and really enjoying life as a kid should have an opportunity to do. And his, his uncle, my, my wife's brother, was treating him more like a father than I ever did. And he got to thinking, boy, this is a lot better life than I've been living. So he started kind of conspiring to go. Right. And he was, I, I wasn't, when you're on the C organization, when you're in the rehabilitation project for us, you're not allowed to talk to family members. Even though my wife was on the rehabilitation project force with me for the last year, and even though I had not seen her for five years before then, when my wife came into the RPF, I wasn't allowed to talk with her, sit with her. I could say hello to her. I couldn't give her a long look. That's yeah. so suppressive in itself. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's not even really, I mean, that wasn't even really the rules when I did the RPF. No. Right? You could talk to RPFers. You, everybody, we could all talk to each other. We just weren't allowed to address staff that were not in the RPF unless they addressed us. That, yeah. was, the only, that was the only requirement. Yeah. So, so, it, uh, so what, what happened was my son had this, uh, this run in and they decided that it's best that he leave. And I didn't know it at the time, but I found out 
by virtue of this rendezvous that these children have with David Miscavige in the elevator, apparently a whole lot of other children were had to go as well. But I was the my son was the only child of a PAC parent in the RPF. Everybody else in the RPF from PAC had no children. My wife and I were the only RPF members that had a minor child in the Because you were the last ones that basically had a kid. Yeah. When the right. issue came out saying yeah. no more kids. Right. Yeah. And uh, so what happened with all these uh, other kids were the children of, of uh, active, productive, not on the RPF Sea Org members. Right. Either in, I guess, in L.A., right? Because they had yeah. kids up at the in, Okay. Anyway. Yeah. So we were routed out and there's all sorts of kind of interesting things, at least to me, that kind of dictated a, a good portion routed of the means being You routed out means you're kicked out, right? Yeah. Or if you wanted to leave, they would route you out. But basically you were you were being sent away from the sea organization, no longer to be there. Yeah. I don't know very many people. I, I don't know right now. I, th I'm, I think I've met one before. I don't know. I, th but right now the only I'm the only one. I me and my wife are the only people I can think of who have wanted to stay in the C organization and were told that they had to go. Most people blow in the dead of night, or if they're brave and courageous, they'll get on a routing form, and a year later they'll get out by virtue of finally. Mm -hmm. Well, well, you, I mean you. Your, your situation sounds unique, but in actuality, I don't know. I think it was like in the early 2000s, a whole, they did a whole offload of staff from the gold base up at Int and sent them away with $500. You know what I mean? Basically just saying you're no longer wanted and out you went. You know, some oh. of those people, I've talked to them. They didn't want to go, but they were sent out. Now they're right. glad they're gone. Now they're glad they're gone. But yeah. at the time, they did not want to leave. You know, wow. we oh, know we that. had we had that on the ship as well. When Hubbard was coming back from New York, before he would come back, anyone who had a PTS, a potential trouble source problem, with family, they were rounded up and actually offloaded to to Los Angeles or out of the Sea Org or wherever. Hmm. Well, I imagine that was kind of kept for public relations reasons. The Phenomenal was kind of withheld from the rest of the sea organization or whatever because this is yeah, new I mean, news it wasn't, to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I and like I said, this all happened after we left. We were no longer in. But right. I remember talking to people like like Neil Lobato, Neil Smed, and Pablo Lobato. You know, they were sent out. You know, with five hundred dollars and basically out, out you go. You know, and there was a bunch of people that were sent out that way. That might have been after us because when I left Pablo Labate, yeah, I think it was. It, it yeah. was. it was in the, like I said, the, the early to mid 2000s. I think like probably mid 2000s because I saw them. They came to visit me in I think, 2007, 2008, something like that. That must have been cool. That's great. But anyway, anyway, anyway so you, you were sent out with your son? Yeah. So what, what happened was uh, we were sent out with uh, my uh, uh the deal was, they, they said, you have to handle your son. He's kind of a misfit. And they gave him a fitness board program of key to life, life orientation course, and PTSSP course. Key to life, there's these basic courses that make yeah, you, yeah. Get you oriented in life, get you to be a better student, and help you with dealing with low tone people, let's say. Yeah. And uh, and I also had to pay off his debt, which was $6,000 or $8,000 or for the EPF, the Estates Project Force, the beginning Sea Org courses. So a 15 year old who basically was doing, you know, yeah. expediter work for two, three years, and he still had a bill that he had to pay the Sea Organizations. Unbelievable. Yeah. And they, and they, uh, yeah, unbelievable, especially since they didn't give him any education. None. And they treated him like that. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, at any rate, so um, now, when, when they came to us and they said, you have to leave the Sea Org, I had no setup for this. I didn't know this was coming. It was just told to me, you're routing out today. The reason why yeah, you had no, I'm sure you had, didn't have very much money, if anything, and you had to go set up a life outside of uh, Scientology or outside of the Sea Org, right? Yeah. 
and and I've been on staff since I was 18 and I'd only had factory jobs and you know s selling you know just minor little minimum uh, minimum uh, wage jobs right as a kid you well, know, what, no what did you end up doing well let me just skip to it a little before I get to that um, I didn't want to go and I said this is wrong I, I've, I've signed a zero contract I'm in this for the duration I'll go fix my kid, but I'm not leaving the Sea Organization. I'm a Sea Org member. It's not going to happen because that's an early decision. I saw, I knew people blew the Sea Org. I knew people left, etc. Right. But uh, I read enough interesting stuff about commitment and purpose. You know, OT orgs. When one has purpose is fully vitalized, all the stops blow. I figure that whole solution to life livingness and being a CR member just get yourself back on purpose this is this momentary difficulties is just because somehow i went off purpose or i wouldn't be living in these circumstances so that i was not going to leave the c organization i said that's not going to happen i'm a CR member he says you got to leave because you took lsd and you can't come back on the sc org i said there's some way this can happen let's how it can happen so yeah, you know, they talked around about it. Somebody came to me uh, to the maybe it was a day later or whatever. Still in the RPF at this time, but I'm very upset. And they said they said to us that, well, we found some reference that says you can get a year's leave of absence. So that's the best you can do. You pull these things off in a year, and you're welcome back. You don't pull them off, and you don't come back. I said, okay, I'll make it go right. So. I went out and now I first started going, going to Sea Org places. I joined the local Way to Happiness chapter. For, right. And this was after th over 30 years that you had yeah. been in Sea Org. Yeah, yeah. Right? You'd been in it for over 30 years. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Anyway, everywhere I go to be a part of a Sea Org group, they say, you can't be here. You're, you, you can't be here. Somebody would contact me and say, you got to leave the Way to Happiness Foundation group. I would... Uh, go to Celebrity Center just to see if I could meet somebody because that little lunch counter thing there, good place to socialize. You can't be here. I try to go to events. You can't be here. They wouldn't allow me to associate with any online Scientologists. Uh, I try my best to, and I finally ended up working uh, uh, somehow or another. I couldn't go to the orgs, but they did allow me to work for this thing called Ultimate Creations, which was going to malls and selling the skin cream used to be pretty big in Vegas or be in the malls. It was called Oldman Creations. You go rub a little bit on their hands. And it was a good way to make a couple hundred bucks on a good day, you know. And, you know, after you're giving your life to the sea, you're rubbing cream on someone's hands, you know, and walking home with a couple hundred bucks. And, and, and you know, and just, it just, I was so, <laughs> I could hardly, I, I just was having a rough time. Anyway, without you know, was she working? Was your wife working too? Yeah, she, by virtue of her central marketing stuff, she took her uh, stuff around to uh, oh, on target research. Bruce Wiseman, different people had little, group, little marketing groups. Yeah, and they didn't put stops on her lines. They didn't tell her that kind of stuff. I think it was because I was, I was known to a lot of public. In LA, I made it my point to be outgoing, gregarious, go to all the class four orgs, say hello, make friends, make contacts. She was always behind a computer, you know, pretty much. And I thought my life is my contacts. I'm going to network. I'm going to get something going here, you know. But it kept. And then they it. they uh, they didn't want that saying, "Hey, how come you're not in the Sea Org anymore?" Yeah, or I, hey, I guess well, so. Know, I, yeah, I, I, I guess. Know. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so I didn't flourish and prosper in that first year. But what I did was one of the things that happened is that we were out of the Sea Org and different kids my son knew as children of the Cadet Org started showing up the house. And I go, oh, what are you doing here? Oh, and the story that developed was that a whole bunch of people, children, were routed out of the Sea Org when we were routed out of the Sea Org that I didn't know about. And it was because David Miscavige and others, I guess, were unhappy with their production that they 
gave to the organization as these people that were brought from the cadet organization. They, they just weren't productive people. They didn't know what they were doing. They couldn't really hold posts of any particularly high responsibility because they didn't have wins in Scientology. It's not that they've been in co-audits and stuff like that. They knew how to clear a few words. They might know three or four Scientology datum, but they weren't like, you know, the children of samurai warriors disciplined in every act of being a samurai or, you know what I mean? They weren't right. little miniature Sea Org members. They were just kids that had had kind right. of a rough time. <laughs> Admit it. No education. Yeah. Yeah. So all these kids started showing up. I started asking what's going on. And they, I found out that what had happened was when my son was routed out and, and my wife and I with him because of him, there were all these other children that were the children of uh, Sea Org members who weren't in the RPF. And we're holding jobs, you know, posts in the C organization that they did not want to let go of. Even though their kids were a handful and a half, they said, let's find public people on their OT levels that need to do a men's project or to get on their OT8, you know, that whatever sins they did that made them having to do some sort of thing, you know, to make them look good, like an immense kind of activity. Yeah. They were all lent out to these, uh, to these people, you know, but to and be like guardians or to be guardians. Yeah. They yeah. were their foster guardians. Child, they were like foster children in them out. And yeah. These were like exactly. Ex yeah. Yeah. God. And this is all part of, this is all part of Miss Scavage's anti family and split parents up and married couples split them up for years. I mean, he was so against, anything like that on the second dynamic yeah yeah so this was like in the first few months and like i mentioned earlier my my mother lived in uh in uh glendale suburb of los angeles and we were the first two or three months that we were out of the sea i was staying in my mother's attic in glendale we were given a thousand dollars each when we were routed out i was actually routed out I, I was let go, but I had to come in once a week for a session. They wanted me out immediately, but I came in every week for a sec check. So it took me several months to get all the way out. My wife had more sec checks to do, so she didn't join us till some about a year later. But she was being routed out for like a year. Anyway, maybe six, eight months. Anyway, something like that. Anyway, so I'm at my house and. And uh, at my mother's house, we've been there for a few months. Some kids have been coming to visit us and this kind of thing. Knock the door. I open the door and there's a cop, a policeman out at the door. And I go, hello. And we talk a little bit. And I said, so, well, so what can I do for you? He says, well, I want you to come out in the front yard. Because there's some kids here that say they know you. And I just want to make sure. And I get out in the front yard and there's seven or eight kids. All these kind of kids that have been visiting my son all sitting down on their butts on the, my mom's front yard. I go, yeah, I know all these kids. What's the deal? I said, well, do you know they've been living in this abandoned van up the street from you? And I go, and I look up the street and there's this van. And I hadn't noticed it was there before. I go, no, I had no idea. He says, yeah, they've been living up there. And they say, this is with your authorization. So I thought fast on my feet and I go, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Because I didn't want to me to get in trouble or them to get in trouble or anybody to get in trouble. You know, I, I sensed pretty quickly that this was a problem. And he says, well, that's not legal. And you can't do that. And I go, okay. I said, these kids are all minors. And I said, yeah, look at, they're members of a church group I'm in. Didn't say anything about Scientology. A little bit of experiment. Please be a little sympathetic to our circumstances. I didn't know this was going on. I'll talk with their parents and we'll get this resolved. And I... So he splits and I have all these kids and I say, man, what's going on? And anyway, they, they told me that it wasn't going well for them in their, their respective places, you know, with these people. With their, they're with their guardian foster yeah, uh, parents, a men's yeah. project. Yeah. And I, you know, I just took them at their word. I didn't call these guardians or whatever to check it out. I just called OSA uh, and said, hey, you know, this happened. And uh, it's not very good. And 
don't remember all the details, the immediate consequence of that. But within a few weeks, I decided, my wife and I decided that we would go rent uh, a big home, the biggest home we could afford with a guest house. We found one. We put bunk beds in there. And we were taking care of about 10, between 10 and 13 kids, all children of Sea Org members, uh, throughout all this time. Uh, well, you know, that first year we were out of the Sea Organization. And, uh, and uh, just because it seemed like the right thing to do. And, and because yeah, well, my son. Yeah, it sounded like it. Yeah. And because, yeah. you know. It might have been more right for me to just call up the the uh, family people, you know, the the guardians, and say, "Hey, you're, you know, resolve this. I got enough problems of my own." But I had kind of that. There's a old flag order that says, "If you're having trouble with one thing, grab another thing and just <laughs> increase your responsibility." I thought, "I'm having troubles. Life's not going well for me. Give me some more problems." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so we took these kids in and, and, uh, and there was all these Scientology. I, I was also, we were also running a little magazine called the latest magazine, which a couple of Scientologists ran and they, they all had all the advertisers were wise members and we would drop off a bundle of these magazines at Peter Gillum's uh, vitamin center and the little George's restaurant. It was just a way for Scientologists to uh, in the wise world to know about each other and do business with other Scientologists. Right. The wise world is the World Institute of Scientology Enterprises. Basically yeah. what it meant was Scientologists would then um, find out about other Scientology businesses that they could use their services to basically keep it all in house. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, and they all paid 10% to wise because they were using Hubbard's technology on um, businesses. Yeah. So there's two publications at that time uh, that wise members have put up. One was called Who, What, Where, which was a little Scientology directory of every Scientology businessman in right. Los Angeles. And there was another one called The Latest Magazine, which would have a few articles nicely aligned with values and this kind of stuff. And all having Scientologist writers, you know, wise members. And they were like advertorials for their products and this kind of stuff. So we had a little bit more money than had been typical, and we thought we could afford. We could move out of our, my mom's house and, and go have our own place and house these kids. So that's what we did. And I got them through the wise members. I got them. Uh, I would go out to construction sites, and I managed these kids to do simple things like dig a ditch and, and post, you know, help out with the surveyors and posting sticks and ri putting ribbons out and do the most menial tasks that require little education. But, you, but they got jobs, basically. They all got jobs. And I figured in, and they all paid a couple hundred dollars a month rent, uh, basically to, uh, uh, you know, to pray that because it was like $6,000 worth of rent and we weren't making that much money. And these but were they, still, these were still kids under 18. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So they weren't adults yet, uh -huh. but they were over 16 so they could work. Yeah. This is like a Charles Dickens story. <laughs> it's a little weird, yeah. But I always thought I could, because I could sense, man. I started looking at six thousand dollars or so to pay off my son's debt. Yeah. And uh, and key to life was like seven thousand dollars, and life orientation course was a few thousand dollars. It was like twenty thousand dollars, and to get him through it, and he's a shitty suit student that's always giving me backflash. And, and you know, and doesn't want to is trying his best not to do a thing I ask him to do. <laughs> As were all these other kids, they're all kind of antagonistic kids. Sly. You can understand why they would be that way. Yeah, they, they just would, yeah. had bad control all their lives. Anything you got close to control, re-stimulated it all. I guess you know. But I managed them. It's like herding cats. It was just like. I tried to keep some so peace. How did this all resolve? I mean, well, what, what happened was the parent of all these kids. <laughs> what what happened was is that after about eleven months, I saw I wasn't I was no closer to getting this target done 
than uh, I had been before of, of educating getting my son through the fitness board stuff. And they were, had been adamant that if I didn't pull this off out of, in a year, that I couldn't be in the Sea Org any longer. So I said, I called up after 11 months. I called somebody up and I says, I'm, I'm not going to pull off this target in a year. And they go, okay, well, we'll give you a fitness board. Okay, okay, good. You'll get something in the mail pretty soon. I got something in the mail, and it was a, an SP declared. And I've been declared an SP because of a violation of leaving and leaves. Uh, uh, leaving and leaves PL says if you say you want to leave the C organization, it's a suppressive act. And I go, well, you know, so I, I made another phone call. I said, you know, it's ridiculous. This is a misunderstanding. I don't want to leave the C org. If you'd allow me in the C org, I'd be happy to go back in the C org tomorrow. Right. Tonight, I'd be, I'd go back in. I don't want to leave the C org. I just can't play by these rules you set up. And it was like, okay, you're going to have to ask for a comment. So I asked for a comment. And I still have all the kids this time, this time, still working for the latest, still doing this stuff. And so I get a comment and it's in pack. I know all the guys on the board of, you know, the members and the chairman and the secretary, everybody involved is somebody I knew. Even one guy was somebody I've been in the RPF with that had graduated since I had been routed out. So I told them what was going on. And they said, oh, man, that's crazy. That's just a misunderstanding. Don't worry. We're going to have this straightened out. I say, oh, cool, cool, cool. So a couple of weeks go by, I get findings and recommendation. Dan Locke, suppressive declare, is hereby ratified uh, for him wanting to leave the C organization. But he is thanked for his last year of cooperation with the C organization by taking care of the children of C org members. <laughs> so I guess I was the nicest SP that they ever <laughs> encountered <laughs> in the same <laughs> issue. Yeah. It's, I'm being thanked and declared an SP. Wow. And so wow. at that time, somebody from security came over and got everybody and took them to other places. And we said our goodbye. Oh, so they, wow. They took it. Oh, yeah. my God. And, and you it's know what's interesting? Back in the early days, I remember a guy, Fred um, Schradel, I think was his name from Australia. He was on the on the Royal Scotland and he had unhandled business in Australia. He asked for a 10 year leave of absence and Hubbard approved it. And then when we were in Clearwater, Fred shows up, his 10 years were up. And, and I'm thinking, why did he even bother? He should have just stayed in, a, in Australia. Nobody knew that he had a 10 year leave of absence. No one knew who he was. The files were so bad, but he had the integrity to come back, and it didn't last long. He left again, but it's been a cool story, huh? <laughs> yeah. And, and let me ask you some questions, okay? Because that's uh, that's how that happened, and it's it's obviously ridiculous how you were treated. I mean, it really is ridiculous. Okay. Well, that's not just one more thing about it. Yeah, okay. Went... We're getting to here. I want I want to ask you some questions. Go yeah. ahead. No, let... Just one yeah, more thing yeah. about it. I still didn't give up. I went through every single justice action that you could do some of them twice and it kept coming back the same way, the exact same way ratified, validated as an SP. So my the conclusion came to me that it's just somebody because the members were always kind. People heard me out, understood, yeah. acknowledged, but somewhere, somebody up above me said no. And I think it's because the reason I got into the SO uh, into the RPF, and it was because my whole game had been for several, for about a year or so, I was a chaplain, maybe two years, I was a chaplain. And I was very, very aggressively bringing back guys into Scientology that had been blown for years and years and years and declared like Ray Camp, Pam, Pam Camp. I was working with them. I was working with all these people that had made a stir in 1982 and 1983. And that right. they had told me, some of them told me, it says, well, you know, conversation would go back and forth. And it became very clear that they could have been treated better back there in 82 and 83. But people, they, they were dismissed. They, they themselves 
so many of those situations back there in that schism in 82 and 83 could have been resolved right then and there, but they didn't. They used it as a, as a stupid house clearing of people who just oh, wouldn't yeah. obey David Miscavige. That, that's exactly okay. right. Hey, yes. Dan, I need to ask you some questions, okay, from uh, the viewer's point of view. Our viewers who are watching this, never in. I, I'm going to ask you questions that I know that they have in their head right now, okay? Number one, how's your son doing and how did that all resolve? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's pretty cool. Qu quickly, I, you know, oftentimes family members have a more difficult fathers and sons. Sometimes there's this, I don't know what it is. It can be difficult for a father to really help a son. You know, emotional attachments, plus me aware of my own faults of not being a father for so long and i think his grievance is legitimate towards me uh so what happened was uh, a wonderful person liz daniker family of scientologists she had been a pro, pro uh, a prodigy at asho she had done the started the briefing course at 13 completed at 15 smart as attack uh, had a long career as a non-seorg auditor auditing the ao in different places lovely person she, uh, I called her up and I said, I'm having difficulty with my son. He won't do a thing I ask him to. I I'm, can't tutor him. I can't get anything done. She dropped by and interviewed him, talked with him, got him through his uh, GED, high school equivalent, got him to Glendale College. It's a junior college in, in uh, Glendale. Uh, got him on the dean's list of a junior college. Might not seem a, like a big deal, but it's a far flung thing from what he had been. Uh, All right. Helped him write a, an essay uh, and do preliminary work for a scholarship and was accepted at, at Berkeley on, on scholarship. Wow. You know, from and within a few years from a, a, a person with a nine year old uh, fourth grade education at 15. Yeah. To on the dean's list at a junior college and accepted on scholarship, at least you know, it was a full, full scholarship is I think his grandfather helped out a little bit financially. Uh, but and then graduated with a bachelor's uh, degree, and now he's uh, uh, a computer whiz guy. You know, knows programming and got a decent job, etc. That's good. Uh, how, how, do you have a good relationship with him now? A little bit. You know, um, um, I'm sympathetic towards Scientology, and I'm kind of you know, I didn't. I had wins in the subject. He had. Uh, he had. Uh, It's okay. It didn't go as right for him as it went for me. And it was wrong for all of us. You know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so he's, a, he's down on Scientology, you know, and, and I'm certainly... Uh, not happy with a lot of the uh, way a lot of things unfolded, but you know, uh, I'm part of that. I'm part of the creation of that, you know. Okay. So, uh, and my only way out, you know, being that it was so much a part of my life, you know, one way to look at it, maybe it's a little bit self aggrandizing or minimizing his pain and, and maximizing my pleasure or whatever, but I had 30 years of adulthood which is hard to change. And, you know, and right. you can say, well, he had 15 years of uh, childhood, but really most of it was, a lot of it was in play and camaraderie, you know. Um, and, you know, and I hopefully, and, you know, he's been able to, he's dug himself out of that rut. I, I you know, it's the only way, only way you can preserve your sanity on any kind of life events is spend at least some something major of your time in, in validating for it and looking for the value of it, or you'll kill yourself, you know? Okay. Well, there, I, I think a lot of people get close to that, you know, like this Walrsheim fella, you know, I, I imagine part of what happened with that analyst, she had to have at one point or another said there must've been some bright spots in there somewhere, Larry, you know, you know, I don't know. Well, we're going to, 
Yeah, we got some more interviewing to do with Larry, and he's going to go over that yeah. and his whole yeah, healing process. Question, though, um, Dan, okay, so our channel's called Peeling the Onion, okay? Uh -huh. So obviously, I know, we know from t interviewing you before that you still believe in Scientology, a lot of the technology, and you still get processing from time to, you know, from time to time. But in looking back on it, I mean, have you looked back on, you know, where it went wrong or where, you know, what, what it was? Cause I mean, I mean, obviously you don't agree with the way you're, you're, they treated the kids and you ended up with all these kids and you did the right thing and helping them out and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But how do you, how do you look at that in retrospect in terms of you spent all this time in Scientology, you know, you had a child, you had uh, your wife and all that. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, you served 30 years and thank you for helping us for a year with these kids, but you're now a declared suppressive person and we don't want to have anything to do with you. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, it's basically, although I, I'm not highly trained, I've studied well what I have studied and I've combed through the axioms and logics and a lot of the basic fundamental of Scientology a lot enough to recognize that most of, not all, but most of the, the best Scientology I am aware of, you can find uh, explanations for it, valid explanations for it, and validity for it in the axioms, the logics, the factors, these kind of things. You can see the sense of it. And you can provide relief for it. You know, I was watching Chris Shelton recently, where somebody wrote into him and said, uh, oh, you know, there's a lot of people that said they felt really great after Scientology processing. And, and he said something like, uh, well, if all you're into is in feeling good, yeah, Scientology is, is, a, is a good thing. It can make you feel really good. Well, you know, I listened to one philosopher who really made a, a mark on me as Esther Hicks recently. And uh, she says, and it made sense to me, that virtually everything, every beingness we want to be, everything we want to do, everything that we want to have, every experience we want to have, every relationship we want to have, every object we want to buy, we're getting that, wanting that, with the idea in mind that we're going to feel better than we do right now in the having of that, in the having of that relationship, that car, that house, that dream job or whatever. If I just had that, I'm going to feel a little bit better. I know myself when I'm feeling good, feeling really positive and right, my life goes right. When I'm feeling down, my decisions are wrong and things go wrong. I think emotions are a big and wonderful thing and a way to guide your life. If you can't be enthusiastic and, and excited about something, you better take another look at whether you should be doing it at all. If you're just getting it, doing it to get along, get a few bucks, you're not gonna, it's not going to end up right. So uh, there's that part of Scientology, which I consider is valid. It's a lot of the processing stuff. It's getting trained as an otter. And then Ron Hubbard threw a lot of different things into the mix. And one of the things is, you know, there's a thing called, uh, I think PDC or various times, he'll say, there must be a game. And he says, all games are aberrative, some are fun, you know. But if Scientology, Scientology's got this thing going on, there's always this ongoing threat that the world's going to blow up. It's about ready to be taken over by teams of SPs and psychiatrists, etc. It's this horrible, horrible, horrible place. And you guys are the lone sparks of sanity. And if you get skilled as an otter, you can do something about it. But we're in a big hurry. And if you don't get your butt in gear real fast and make some sacrifices, it could all come down. So your individual involvement and your over the top involvement and you forget everything else in your life involvement is so important so crucial to us getting ahead that's the way you're expected to live your life right and, well, and I remember them. that that introduction of that kind of admin scale so to speak or that yeah. modus operandi that we're all in a hurry etc haste makes waste and the sea org's life is generally one of haste of ill thought actions poorly thought out policies, policies, so many of these, but like the disconnection policies is the main one. It creates so many more so 
brief little problem solver in the short run. But look what all these guys, everybody in the anti-Scientology camp, if they were treated more decently while they were involved, you know, if they were just given a greater involvement in their other dynamics, allowed to participate on their own determinism without the threat of the world going to hell in flames if they didn't step up, they'd still be involved, or some of them. You know, yeah, I, there's I enough of validity agree. in what's lovely in Scientology. Wouldn't take much of, you know, it might not be, you know, I, I've always thought if Scientology was delivered without threat on the part of the, CR, of the people administering Scientology, if they were said, you know, the world is a lovely place. Look at Earth as your playground. Look at fellow citizens as fellow child, children of God to be respected and admired and treated with courtesy and respect in all circumstances, you know, that the typical Scientology experience would be a couple of intensives of auditing, get through a Scientology handbook to learn some basics on life. 25 hours, you'd be on a persistent FN. You'd probably only come back when there would be a, a divorce or a death of a significant other to run out the, uh, run out the loss. And, you know, instead of this continual, uh, group induced frantic activity of you haven't done enough and we're still in horrible shape and here's the next emergency we're going to try and motivate everybody on for the next number of years right. Right. That, that's 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 the dichotomy of scientology you know it's like there's personal benefits that people get from it you know they're that they're, they talk about it all the time they get these personal benefits but then you have the organization that will discard people and yeah. discard their family and yeah. neglect their children yeah. and and do all these things that are really destructive and they don't care the organization yeah. does not care about that yeah and that's where it gets abusive and that's where it's like something that cannot be evolved i would bet I'd be willing to bet that now when you you probably you, I think you get processing from a field auditor, which is not part of the overall big organization, and it's a much more much more inviting environment, I would think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's RJ sixty seven and that that kind of thing of like the world's just about ready to go to hell, and you know we got to put ethics in on the planet. It got this nice big fat impulse of willingness, but then with the discourtesies and the bad manners and the insults and the harassment that followed that's not scientology it's something no. else something well you wild. know i remember i remember in 78 hubbard saying we've got five years the Marcabians are coming well how many years ago was was 1978 and you know you bring up the way to happiness i remember when that was released i was like oh finally people are going to be respectful to each other the yelling's going to stop things will calm down and people will follow way to happiness no it didn't apply to sea oak members <laughs> yeah yeah you know and dan and dan it's just i'm sorry janice i didn't mean to interrupt. that's okay no i just was going to say and that that's really the you know the the problem or the intention counter intention you know what i mean i got a lot of benefit when i was in scientology too as a public person and then i was dedicated like you were as a sea org member but then when i could see behind the curtain and see the abuses that were going on and this is way before a lot of the stuff that you're talking about i went this is not why i got involved with this i'm leaving i'm getting out of here because that's not what that's not what i was there for you know and it's right. just it's just it's a shame that the good things have all these bad things attached to it as well yeah. because the bad things need to end you know they need yeah. to stop they need to stop the abuse uh these children that you know you thankfully took care of for that year uh, i'm sure they appreciated what you did for them but the fact that they were in that position in the first place those children is wrong and they yeah. need to change that you know yeah. that should have never happened you know yeah 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 and you know what they all need to realize is these are good people that are out here. Yeah. People, you know, I'm a good person. You're a good person. We're, Mark's a good person. We're not suppressive people. We're not suppressing other people. And we're not even suppressing them. Yeah. So it's like we're a wrong item on them. Whoa. That, 
the the wear SPs. That's a yeah. wrong item yeah. to you saying that you are one or to them saying that you are one. Yeah. And that's what they have to recognize is there's two and a half percent for what Scientologists believe that from based off Hubbard saying of real suppressive people. Those are not people like us. We are all good people just trying to help and get on with our life and disagreeing with the abuse that's been going on and the disconnection. Yeah. You know, with family members being disconnected, just like what happened with you and your wife and, yeah. and then all the children. Those are things that should never have happened in the first place that create these situations. Yeah. And Scientologists, by doing nothing about it, I'm making it worse. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I totally then, agree. And then, and then there's, and then the, the but then there's the society. Sometimes has to take action because we could talk to individuals, people in Scientology, but you know they hide behind their tax exemption, you know, as saying they're a religion and therefore that people cannot sue for the abuses that have been going on or or the the harm that has been done okay that's got to change because the fact of the matter is is big corporations don't change their safety rules until till they're made to do so sometimes and that's something if scientology wants to survive they have to make some major changes and that's not going to happen just through one or two people here or there there has to be big changes made and that's why it's important the, the fight that's going on to try and get rid of their tax exempt status and actually let these people that are fighting for the, uh, uh, you know, to get rewarded for the abuses to be able to carry, do their cases because already there's been lots of changes in Scientology since people have been speaking out. Apparently the rehabilitation project force doesn't exist anymore. The whole was gotten rid of. Some of these abuses are changing just through the actions of the different people speaking out about it and, forcing light upon it but there's much more of this that needs to happen it's not just david miscavige needs to go away and die there's other things in that organization that are going to have to change okay. we're going to we're going to end off here because we could go on all night otherwise yeah <laughs> but, but now will there anyway. be a step part four of the 37 of course. Uh, volume we, yes we only got through one story we were going to talk about today and you know <laughs> the, you know it's, it, it's an involved story but i'm glad that you told it dan and we're happy that you're here and i just want to say to everybody uh please subscribe to our channel if you haven't already uh, we cover this story. We cover lots of stories about Scientology. If you have any questions or comments about what we've talked about, go down to that comment section. Janice loves the comments, so I do too. But Janice, I do. I how I many comments? How many comments? You know. So anyway, go down there and write comments. Uh, Janice appreciates that. And then also, if you'd like to support our channel, you can buy us a coffee. There's a link down below in the description. Click on that, and we appreciate any support.